Deal with a matter of Secretary of State for Health and another and Servia Laboratories Limited and others. These are my lords, uh, contrary to what you may have expected, indeed hoped from the skeleton arguments, um, I am preparing uh, for the appellant uh, with Milan and friend Mr. Drake, Ms. Bacon and uh, Queen's Council and Mr. Pitchenin uh, are appearing for the respondents. I was hoping to address you uh, very broadly uh, and as simply as I can under five uh, headings. Uh, first, to make some preliminary introductory observations. Um, secondly, just to look at some of the older case law, by which I mean pre-OBG and Allen. Uh, thirdly, to look at OBG and Allen. Fourthly, to look at some things that have been said since that judgment. Uh, and finally, to address you briefly uh, on the uh, concept and the limits of the doctrine of precedent in common law. Um, Moving then on to the preliminary remarks, um, obviously, as you will be aware from uh, the documents you have seen, um, uh, this was a strikeout case. Uh, it was a, a strikeout on the law, as it's sometimes described. You'll, you, you may be aware there's a, a, a sort of an informal classification of strikeout applications, some on the grounds that they can't succeed because the facts are hopeless, some on the grounds they can't succeed because even if the facts are all proved, the pleaded claim doesn't disclose a cause of action, and that is usually yeah, described. I'm invited to assume that there was a fraud on the patent office. Exactly so. Um, so, so exactly so. The, 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 the two things that follow uh, from this being uh, a, a strikeout application on the law um, is, uh, first, exactly that point, that uh, you assume that we will be able to prove at trial the factual allegations made in the pleading, uh, and secondly, uh, obviously the test you will be applying is not uh, whether the claim is likely or unlikely to succeed, uh, but whether it is bound to fail. Uh, and if you are uncertain on that issue, as I hope you will be at least uh, by the end of the hearing, uh, then uh, the claim ought to be allowed to proceed to trial. Um, I don't want to spend um, a, 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 any lengthy amount of time uh, on the pleaded claim, because you'll have seen the relevant paragraphs summarised uh, in the um, uh, judgment of Mr. Justice Roth, but if we could just very briefly go uh, in the core bundle at tab 8. You have the amended claim form, and there are brief details of the claim on paragraphs uh, and on page 71 of the bundle. see uh, that the claimants are described as the successors entitled to claims um, of uh, uh, bodies which have themselves borne the cost of reimbursing pharmacists and doctors for drugs dispensed in the community by the NHS since 2001. The defendants constitute an economic undertaking. The claim is for damages arising from the defendants having between around July 01 and July 07 formed and implemented a strategy of preventing the entry and or expansion of generic perindocryl onto the said market by first applying to the European Patent Office and defending the patent 947, as it's known for short, uh, in opposition proceedings in the EPO in circumstances where the defendants knew that patent to be invalid and or had no honest belief that it was or might be valid and or providing misleading information as to the validity of the patent and or failed to make transparent disclosure of information relevant to the validity of the patent and or conducted themselves unreasonably and or abusively in that the invalidity of the patent ought reasonably to be <coughs> manifest to them and two, attempting to enforce the said patent through actual and or threatened proceedings against actual or potential competitors. Um, and uh, that gives rise to uh, a number of causes of action, some uh, uh, Competition uh, Act claims, abuse of dominant position and so on, uh, and uh, separately the tort with which we are concerned, which has been uh, generally described as causing loss by unlawful means. Um, while we have that open, can I just mention one thing which I am sure doesn't matter, but I would just mention it anyway. You will see on page 73... The pleading is described as confidential particulars of claim. There are certain paragraphs in it which remain confidential. I was going to add, rather than taking you to it, because it doesn't 
affect the issues that we are concerned with, but just in case, uh, in the course of giving judgment, you are tempted to um, uh, uh, mention particular parts of the pleading, can we just hand up a single page which identifies those paragraphs which remain in the pleading, which are confidential? So, so there's nothing remotely controversial, and I don't think there's anything even relevant. I'm handing it up as an abund out of an abundance of caution. Um, the uh, those are agreed, are they, Mr. Crowley? Yes, the I think that long yes, I, I believe. Um, uh, and um, the paragraphs. And you'll learn it's very so she responds to me, sotto <laughs> um, the, the, the relevant paragraphs, and I don't think there's anything confidential. Can I just hand those um, around? So, oh, I see what we've got. We've got. Have we got copies for the. I don't know if it assists just to have the sheet that identifies the passages or actually have copies of the pleading with the relevant passages um, highlighted. So I will hand up three. Uh, yeah. As I, I, as I, as I, sorry, I should have um, just checked that, but I don't believe there's anything uh, controversial in there. Uh, well, 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 that's that being done, Mr. Crowley. Am I right in thinking, and I've read somewhere, that the tort, the alleged tort that we're concerned with, is only alleged against the third defendant? Uh, is that right? I saw that somewhere. That it was only yes. LLS that was the affected defendant, and it maybe it doesn't matter why. But uh, uh, It may not, and I, I, I remember reading something similar uh, myself, and I can't now... Recall whether Maybe that it doesn't matter. matter. Can I just check and get back to you? Okay. The, re the relevant paragraphs, which uh, you will have seen quoted in Mr. Justice Roth's judgment, start at page 108 of the bundle. I won't read them uh, out to you. But you'll see it's paragraphs 73 to 78 uh, of the pleading, and there is nothing, I think, confidential in those. Um, so uh, we can uh, put that away and um, simply recognise that the uh, argument that you are about to hear and resolve uh, proceeds on the assumed basis that we will have proved that the defendants uh, dishonestly plundered £200 million from the public purse by lying to two public authorities, the European Patent Office uh, and the English courts, uh, intending to profit uh, from those lies and indeed profiting um, and it is against that background uh, that this court will need to decide whether the claim in tort uh, is bound to fail. And while you are considering that question, we would invite your lordships to ask yourselves why the law should wish to produce that result. Why uh, what is uh, often regarded as the genius of the common law uh, should deliberately choose to be so willfully unimaginative when faced with assumed at this stage, facts uh, of that nature. Um, the issue itself, as you are, I, I'm sure, aware, uh, it is uh, shortly stated. It is um, a question as to the true scope uh, of the tort of causing loss by unlawful means, uh, and the issue turns on a correct understanding uh, of the ratio in the House of Lords uh, speeches in OBG and Allen. Um, just to put it in context, I'm sure you've already got this um, perfectly clearly in mind, but just to state the obvious, causing loss by unlawful means has been described as a three-party tort uh, in the sense that there is a claimant who can sue a defendant uh, in circumstances where the defendant has acted unlawfully against a third party, um, intending by that unlawful action to cause harm to the claimant uh, and um, uh, causing such harm, irrespective of whether the third party, who is the, in a sense, the direct object uh, of the unlawful action, has themselves suffered any loss or not. And the specific question uh, that's raised in this appeal is whether the decision in OBG and Allen confines the operation of the tort only to situations where the defendant's actions interfere with the third party's freedom to deal with the claimant. It's that freedom to deal with the claimant issue that is at the heart of this appeal. Um, if OBG and Allen does confine the operation of the tort to situations where the defendant's unlawful action interferes with the third party freedoms 
of the third party's freedom to deal with the claimant, uh, then the tort claim in this action was rightly struck out. Because as you will appreciate, the three parties uh, in this claim are the claimants who hold the causes of action formally vested in the various um, strategic health authorities and, and uh, primary care trusts, which were the bodies that themselves reimbursed the pharmacists who had paid the inflated prices for the drugs, the drug, um, as a result of the, the defendant's uh, deceit. The defendants, the second party, they are the pharmaceutical companies um, who obtained and enforced the patent. And the third party uh, is the European Patent Office and the English courts uh, against whom the assumed deceit was practiced. And we accept that there is no basis for suggesting that on those facts there was any interference with the ability of the European Patent Office or the English courts to deal in any commercial sense with the claimants. So if that is a requirement, if there is a requirement for commercial dealing as between the interfered with third party and the claimant, uh, then that requirement is not satisfied in this case. Um, so um, obviously the question for this appeal is whether that um, uh, re restriction on the tort exists. The answer is going to be found principally in OBG and Allen. Um, but before getting on to that, um, OBG and Allen itself reviews and approves a considerable amount of previous case law. Uh, and so it is uh, necessary to have a look at some of that uh, case law in order to understand what um, OBG and Allen was considering and um, approving. Now, um, moving on then to some of that case law, my second heading, the, the pre-OBG and Allen case law, um, reference was made uh, in the case to two of the earliest decisions uh, which appear to have uh, relied on this tort. There was a case in 1620 called Garrett and Taylor um, about a quarry owner whose workers and customers were scared off by uh, threats and, uh, of litigation and, and, and other, other matters. And there was the case of Tarleton and Magorley, uh, which you may remember was the, the um, uh, two, two British ships in African waters, one of whom fired cannon uh, on approaching canoe uh, in order to scare off and if he did more than that because I'm afraid killed one of the uh, occupants of the canoe in order to scare the, um, the, 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 the locals from trading with the, the rival ship. Um, those um, appear to have been the two and, and Lord Hoffman uh, in a subsequent article um, uh, uh, refers slightly, somewhat slightingly to the uh, paucity uh, of case law uh, in, the, in, in um, earlier days. Uh, but those um, are, in fact, cases only involved, uh, involving uh, questions of, of competition. In a sense, the grandfather of our aspect of the tort, which is a tort where a public authority is deceived, um, the grandfather, um, for our purposes, is a case called Newman and Zachary, uh, which is in volume two of the authorities bundle, um, and dating from 1646, uh, volume two, tab 12, when you could get three law reports on one page. Um, it's the third. <coughs> An action is surely a case for his false practices, <coughs> creating trouble to the plaintiff. Action is surely a case. The plaintiff declares that the defendant was his shepherd. Two of his sheep, sheep did astray, one of which being found again, the defendant affirmed to be the plaintiff's, whereupon the plaintiff paid for the feeding of it, caused it to be shorn and marked with his own stock. And yet afterwards, the defendant malitios machinans to disgrace the plaintiff, knowing the said sheep to be the plaintiff's, falsely et <coughs> fraudulanta affirm of it to the bailiff of the manor, that had waifs and strays belonging to it, that this sheep was an estray, whereupon the bailiff seized it to his damage. Um, and after a verdict, uh, the plaintiff latch moved that there was no cause of action, uh, for there is no breach after verdict for the plaintiff, sorry, I misread that. After verdict for the plaintiff, <coughs> Latch moved that there was no cause of action, for there is no breach of trust in <coughs> the defendant as shepherd, and his words cannot endamage the plaintiff, for he shall have his remedy against the bailiff of the manor that seized the sheep wrongfully. But it was a judge that the action would lie, because the defendant by his false practice hath created a trouble, disgrace, and damage to the plaintiff. 
and though the plaintiff hath, have cause of action against the bailiff, yet this will not take off his action against the defendant in respect to the trouble and charge that he must undergo in the recovery against the bailiff. And Hale said that if one slander my title, whereby I am wrongfully disturbed in my possession, though I have remedy against the trespasser, I shall have an action against him that caused the disturbance. So quite um, uh, shortly and simply there, uh, we have a deceit practised on a public authority, the bailiff, with the intention of injuring the plaintiff, the, sheep, the true sheep owner, uh, and uh, on that three-party um, uh, situation, the claim was upheld. Uh, is that, is that a, is a court, court of King's Bench case that looks at the top, is that right? Yes, I think that is right. Uh, we, we, yeah. It seems to be all the case about slander of title. Um, uh, my lord, it, it's, uh, that is certainly some of the language that is used in order to explain the outcome, but it's... Um, uh, what was done was a, a deception against a public authority with a view to the public authority taking action, namely a seizure, causing loss. And that, that is, uh, what the, that, that is the, 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 the essential elements of the aspect of the tort. There's much about the tort of slander of title, but it was a well-known tort in the, uh, at any rate, uh, 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 the past history. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to be a very firm foundation Lord, it depends what you mean by firm foundation. I'm, I'm not suggesting that the, 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 the case law begins and ends in, in, in the year that Charles I surrendered to the Scots, but um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it is an early illustration. And the fact that um, it was not picked up in um, Allen and Flood or OBG and Allen is an assumption and illustration of the fact that the, the, the cases, and this, this is quite apparent um, in, the, um, uh, in the case law as, as it develops, the case law uh, which leads up to OBG and Allen and, and on which Lord Hoffman subsequently uh, comments in, in, um, extrajudicially in an article is focused on, really on two things. One is um, tra trade relations, trades unions, strike action and the lawfulness um, uh, of that in the late 19th century. Uh, and secondly, pure competition law claims as between trading competitors. Now, that is not factually our situation. The claim that is being brought on behalf of the, the public purse is not a claim that's got anything to do with industrial action incited by trades unions. It's got nothing to do with competition law as such, in the sense that this claim is a claim by the public purse, essentially as a consumer, against um, a monopolist who should never have had that monopoly and only got it as a result of deceiving a public authority. If your lordships don't find Newman and Zachary um, uh, particularly helpful, then I will bear that um, uh, with uh, as much equanimity as I can manage. But we thought it was helpful to illustrate okay. that, it does, that, it, that the, the, the talk does not appear out of nowhere. Uh, and um, Someone must be congratulated on finding it. Uh, and you've well, been I, I've got a different sure query. I've got me. a different query. I don't understand why you say the bailiff of the manor was a public figure. I mean, the bailiff of the manor is in the same position as, uh, let's say, the steward of um, an estate nowadays. I mean, he's not a public figure in the sense that he's a state appointee or that he's appointed by uh, the public. Or in any sense, that he's simply uh, a person who, on behalf of the lord of the manor, private person, um, deals with the, um, the matters of the manor, that's all. Uh if, if your lordship is right on that, and I don't doubt that you are, then um, I, I stand corrected. But it, it, it is um, a, a, an early illustration, uh, nonetheless, whether, whether the bailiff was performing a public function or a private interest function. Uh, it is uh, nonetheless a, 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 an early illustration of uh, the application of this tort, otherwise than in the two factual situations which preoccupy the case law, and to some extent seem to have guided the, the, the phraseology in some of the later case law. Yes, I, I thought you were relying upon this, and you, you summed it up, I think, as saying that's a good example yeah. of the seat on a public authority. I did. All I'm quite querying, I think, uh, is that the suggestion that the bailiff of a, of a manor, who's an entirely private person representing a private owner, is a public authority, that's all. Um, Lord, could, could, can I get back to you on the history of the position of the bailiff of the manor, if I think it will help you? <laughs> I suppose you'd say that it does at least uh, 
it's, it's outside the field of, of interfering with a dealing by a yes. third party. It's, it, 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 it certainly is that. It certainly is that. Um, uh, so, um, can we then move on uh, to Allen and Flood, which is in the first authority bundle at tab two. Because this is the, 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 the first time the, the particular tort uh, was um, examined in, in uh, any real d detail. And um, if lordships uh, haven't looked at it recently, the... the can I just, I just, I'm just, I'm just, so we, we're going here quite quickly. I want to just take up the problem of the law, which you accepted, which is outside the dealing category. And I yeah. wonder whether that's correct, oh, because uh, in, in, in the case of a manor, uh, many people would have dealings and continual dealings with the bailiff, not as a public figure, but as the person who would be arranging the affairs of the manor, for example, in relation to common rights and so on and so forth. So, again, I just want to put on a query. He may be right, you may be right, but I wouldn't regard that as straightforward. Um, Lord, uh, it, I, I don't think anything from 1646 is likely to be straightforward to 21st century eyes. Um, but um, I'm just giving you an opportunity of commenting. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. It, it, if right, we have duty to, to collect waifs and strays may not be something that is uh, uh, pertinent to every manner, I suppose. And uh, maybe one has to think of how that uh, right or duty uh, 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 does uh, uh, emerge. Yes, yes. Well, if I'm going to get anything useful out of it, I will, I will get back to you on that. Um, Alan and Flood. Um, the, the facts uh, very shortly were that certain iron workers, boiler workers, um, uh, in a shipyard had threatened to go on strike unless the uh, shipbuilder sacked the shipwrights who were employed to work on the, on the woodwork of the ship but had also in the past uh, worked on ironworks and therefore uh, were regarded as known grata. Um, uh, the shipwrights, the, the shipbuilder um, uh, did um, uh, discontinue employing the shipwrights and so they sued, the, the shipwrights sued the representative of the union uh, of the iron workers for causing them to be sacked. Um, and uh, ultimately what was decided uh, was that the um, uh, claim didn't, uh, uh, could not be sustained because the uh, trade, trade union representative himself had done nothing unlawful. And what divided the majority... Um, and it was a nine-man, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, nine-man court, uh, uh, nine-man house. Uh, the, the, the divided six-three. What what divided the uh, majority from the minority was the simple question whether, if malice was proved against the defendant, that was in itself sufficient to render his conduct um, actionable or whether his conduct uh, as against the third party, in this case the ship builder, whether his conduct had itself to be unlawful. And that is the debate that was had in the House uh, in uh, Allen and Flood, and the majority took the view that the defendant's action as against the third party, the ship uh, builder, had to be unlawful, whereas the minority considered that malice uh, was sufficient. Um, apart from their answer on that issue, um, the uh, analysis by uh, the various members of the House uh, on the uh, tort um, doesn't actually differ, and it's as helpful to look at some of the minorities as, as well as the majority. Um, but the one thing that we submit does emerge perfectly clearly from this is that none of the nine members of the House um, uh, who considered the uh, uh, matter uh, reached the conclusion uh, that there was any dealing requirement in the sense that, that, that we're talking about. There was no expression of any view that the tort could only be complete if the action of the defendant uh, interfered with the third party's freedom to deal uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the plaintiff. And if we could just very briefly run through a couple of the uh, passages. So starting, if we go to page 67, just immediately after the head note, uh, we have Lord Halsbury. Um, he dissented as to the outcome, uh, but it's um, uh, helpful just to start by um, uh, looking at what he says in, in relation to the matters that were not controversial. 
And if we go on page 68, um, could I, uh, rather than reading out everything, could I just invite your Lordship's attention to the second paragraph on page 68, uh, because uh, just to put the, the debate um, uh, in context, uh, the either finding or assumption was made that the, the, the ship rights who were sacked, the plaintiffs, didn't have a contract of employment. They simply turned up daily and worked for remuneration. So this was not a case of inducing breach of contract because there was no continuing contract between the ship builder and the plaintiff uh, ship rights. Um, and so if I could just invite your lordships to, 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 to look at the paragraph beginning, I think there is much to be said. Which page? Sorry, page, exactly 68, page 68. 68, yes. 68 um, second complete paragraph. I think there is much to be said. Uh, and then if we go on to paragraph 71... Page, page sorry, page 71. Uh, in the middle of the page, Lord Halsbury says, the first objection made to the plaintiff's right to recover for the loss which they thus undoubtedly suffered is that no right of the plaintiff's was infringed and that the right contended for on their behalf is not a right recognised by law or at all events only such a right as everyone else is entitled to deprive them of if they stop short of physical violence or obstruction. I think the right to employ their labour as they will is a right both recognised by the law and sufficiently guarded by its provisions to make any undue interference with that right an actionable wrong. So the analysis that was being conducted was not, is there a requirement in the tort that a defendant should interfere with freedom to deal? The, the question that was being asked was, did the plaintiffs have any right that was being interfered with? And that is then considered, and if we just turn over the page to page 72, uh, having uh, 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 mentioned um, earlier case law uh, about a schoolmaster whose, whose pupils were um, uh, scared off and so on, uh, at the top, and, and the, the quarry owner case, um, uh, the, his lordship then ends that paragraph at the top of page 72. They were third persons. No violence or threats were applied to them, and the cause of action, which they had a right to insist on, was the indirect effect upon themselves of violence and threats applied to others. So again, um, the tort is being described not by reference to an interference with a freedom on the part of the third party to deal with the claimant, but injury being inflicted on the plaintiff indirectly by a wrong done to the third party. And then we go on to page 74. says first it said that the company were acting within their legal rights and discharging the plaintiffs, so they were. But does that affect a question of the responsibility of the person who caused them, say, to act by the means he used? The scholars who went away from the school were entitled to do so. The miners were entitled to cease working at the quarry. The natives were entitled to avoid running the risk of being shot. But the question is, what was the cause of their thus exercising their legal right? The question must be whether what was done in fact and what did in fact procure the dismissal of the plaintiff was an actionable wrong or not. I have never heard that a man who was dismissed from his service by reason of some slander could not maintain an action against the slanderer because the master had a legal right to discharge him. So again, the whole process of the analysis, and this matters when we get to OBG and Allen, is focusing on whether or not the plaintiff had a right that was interfered with and the question whether or not an actionable wrong was done. We can then move forward to page 90. We see, um, uh, I, I won't spend longer on Lord Halsbury because I say he was on the, in the minority on the outcome in, in relation to the specific question. 
Lord Watson starts his speech, page 90, and he um, speaks for the majority. If we go to page 92... see uh, the issue that divided the house um, seven lines down there's a line beginning with the word trues it is true that the company is not a party to this suit but it's also obvious that the character of the act induced whether legal or illegal may have a bearing upon the liability in law of the person who procured it the whole pith of the verdict insofar as it directly concerns the appellant is contained in the word maliciously, a word which is susceptible to many different meanings. The expression maliciously induce, as it occurs upon the face of the verdict, is ambiguous. It's capable of signifying that the appellant knowingly induced an act which itself constituted a civil wrong, or it may simply mean that the appellant procured with intent to injure the respondent an act which, apart from motive, would not have amounted to a civil wrong. And it is, in my opinion, material to ascertain in which of these senses it was used by the jury. That was the, the question that divided the House, whether uh, what the tort was complete only uh, if, if a lawful act was done, but done maliciously, or whether what was done itself constituted a civil wrong. And uh, picking it up again on the next page, page 93, Lord Bowen. Uh, just uh, the first paragraph break. Lord Bowen, um, uh, in the case of Mogul Steamship and McGregor, laid it down that in order to constitute legal malice, the act done must, apart from bad motive, amount to a violation of law. The learned judge, with his accustomed accuracy and felicity, said uh, we were invited by the plaintiff's counsel to accept the position from which their argument started, that an action will lie if a man maliciously and wrongfully conducts himself so as to injure another in that other's trade. Obscurity resides in the language used to state this proposition. The terms maliciously, wrongfully, and injure are all uh, are words, all of which have accurate meanings well known to the law, but which have also a popular and less precise significance, into which it's necessary to see that the argument does not imperceptibly slide. An intent to injure in strictness means no more than intent to harm. It connotes an attempt to do wrongful harm. Maliciously, in like manner, means and implies an intention to do an act which is wrongful to the detriment of another. The term wrongful imports in terms the infringement of some right. And then just in the middle paragraph of the page, the root of the principle is that in any legal question, malice depends not upon evil motive, which influenced the mind of the actor, but upon the illegal character of the act which he contemplated and committed. In my opinion, it is alike consistent with reason and common sense that when the act is done, apart from the feelings which prompted it, legal, the civil uh, law ought to take no cognizance of its motive. So the entirety of the debate, as we see, uh, and I, I, I won't carry on reading, but in paragraph 96, sorry, page 96, middle paragraph again, if I could commend that to you, the entirety of the debate that is going on is uh, on this question as to whether the act of the defendant must be inherently unlawful as against the third party, or whether it is sufficient that the act of the defendant is uh, uh, lawful but motivated by a malicious intent to injure the plaintiff. Uh, and that is what was being decided uh, in this case. We can just pick it up a couple more references. Page 114. Page 114, we see uh, the speech of Lord Herschel begins, and he gives uh, the longest and um, uh, uh, sometimes the most cited speech. We just go on in his speech to page 118, where again he picks up at the top of 118, it's to be observed in the first place that the company... One, three, one duty, 134. I'm so sorry, I cited this. Sorry, I said 114. 114, one, 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 is where Lord Herschel's speech begins. Yes. 118, at the top of the page, it says it's to be observed in the first place that the company, in declining to employ the plaintiffs, were violating no contracts, they were doing nothing wrongful in the eye of the law. The course which they took was dictated by self-interest, they were anxious to avoid inconvenience to their business, 
um, uh, which would ensue from the cessation of work on behalf of the ironworkers. It's not contended at the bar that merely to induce them to take this course would constitute a legal wrong, but it was said to do so because the person inducing them acted maliciously. So again, we get a very clear statement of the issue that was being debated. And if we go on to page 132, we see a clear statement of, of, of the argument, page 132, in the middle of the page. I have been dealing so far with the ground upon which the judgment in the court below proceeded. The learned counsel for the response, however, have rested their argument mainly upon a different ground, and it's this ground. Uh, and not that taken in the court below, which is found most favourable by the learned judges who think the plaintiff's entitled to judgment. It is contended that the defendant, by the course he took, had interfered with the plaintiffs in their trade or calling, and that this of itself was an actionable wrong. In support of this very broad proposition, reliance was mainly placed uh, on the case of Keeble and Hickeringill. Keeble and Hickeringill was another um, uh, uh, countryside case where uh, some one landowner had uh, a pond on which he had decoys, uh, with a view to attracting duck, which he would then shoot. His neighbour um, spent his time firing his gun on his land in order to scare the duck away. So there was, it wasn't a third-party situation, uh, but there was an act done by one party on his own land, uh, which was said to be lawful in the sense he can fire his guns if he wants to, but he was doing it in order to scare off the duck from the plaintiff's land. Uh, and, and on that basis... Um, the argument, as you will see from the paragraph I just read, was that the, the, the argument was that the defendant, by the course he took, had interfered with the plaintiffs in their trade or calling, and that this of itself was an actionable wrong. So it, it, the argument was not there was an interference in the freedom of the defendant to, uh, sorry, the freedom of the third party 